Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Jenny Bielfield, President and CEO of Washington Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., Kelly Twidell, Executive Director of the San Francisco Ballet, and James Johnson, Chief Executive Officer of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show or afterwards. So we have never, we have never, ever experienced something like this. Could you talk about, Jenny, what, what you are encountering in Washington and how you're dealing with this coronavirus situation where it's just impossible to gather people together and have this arts performance experience that we are all so accustomed to and, and that we all love. Absolutely, no, thank you and hello to everyone. We really appreciate this forum. Um, I have to say, you know, it, obviously this has been an extraordinarily challenging time and it's different for every organization. Washington Performing Arts does not own or operate its own venue, and we don't have a collective bargaining agreement. We're a multi-arts presenter with a heavy focus on all genres of music, and we use venues all over the city. But we also have programs in 100 public schools, we have two gospel choirs, we have a thriving Mars Arts DC local focus. So at first, we had to unwind half of our season of all of these different events, thousands of transactions, um, and to really communicate, prioritize uh, communicating with our patrons at a really um, continuous and impactful and transparent level. At the same time, we created a, a new configuration of staff to begin to mine the different uh, digital content that we could offer because the connection to the patron and support for the artists have been paramount at every turn. We did you know, provide honoraria for the independent artists whose concerts we had to cancel. So we wanted to be sure that we were honoring our covenants with our patrons and our um, artists and our partners. The team created um, formats for digital content. Right before this, I do have to add that we, just as all the, um, the mass gathering numbers were beginning to close down, we were on the threshold of a gala with 600 people at the National Building Museum with films done, many different paddle raises, auction, and, and um, All opportunities those costs, to bid and but, support. But no revenue, right? Well, we had sold the tables and, and the packages ahead of time. With 72 hours, we pivoted and created an all digital virtual gala that was on site at a smaller location, the Salamander Resort in Middleburg. And we transferred everything that we could there. So we had a virtual gala, we raised money, there was live bidding. Um, we actually came very close to achieving our revenue goals. Many of the costs went away. Um, we were able to contribute the food to a local um, food kitchen and the flowers otherwise. But we, we gained very quickly the confidence that we could begin to look at what we do in a digital, um, in a digital realm. So as we exist in this new form, we really are emphasizing our core mission and we're thinking about what we're doing from a position of abundance rather than scarcity. And by that, I mean that we know that there will be a lot of things that do not come back right away. It will be a very long time before the economy recovers, before people are comfortable going back into the venue and there's data and survey feedback that supports that. So instead of lamenting that we won't be together because it is, uh, it is unimaginable, we're trying to figure out ways where we can be together and share unique experiences that our artists are creating with our audience. That's and become so our focus. When you, when you look at how artists um, are, are sharing their experience, you, uh, Kelly, have a different situation. Your artists, your, your dancers at San Francisco Ballet, uh, Helgi Thomason, who is a phenomenal choreographer, how do you create art when so much of this is about touching and presence and rehearsing together. How does that function? Yeah, so um, the San Francisco Ballet, just to, uh, to put it in uh, perspective, we were um, the first major um, organization um, in our city and uh, in the country to have our venue closed. It, it closed on um, March 7th. We opened a program on March 6th and closed on March Six, <laughs> um, and we're a fifty-two million dollar co company. Seven collective bargaining units, 
Um, and we had been in the conversation about uh, social um, networks and um, social media and how do we use it and how um, all the intellectual property rights and then this happened. And I will say it has transformed how we think about creation. Um, first and foremost, just to give the perspective is that uh, we just threw all of the rules out the, out the window. I went to our, our unions and said, look, we're in a, um, a situation where um, public safety and our just uh, essence of who we are is at, um, at peril. And um, they said, as long as you pay artists, um, you could use a digital space however you want. So we have been really experimenting of what that means of using the digital space from people um, creating. Uh, we were the first, uh, the first major urban place to shelter at home. We were sheltered at home and have been and continue to be um, since March 17th. So um, we have enabled content. People are um, creating in. Um, in um, their small spaces or outdoor spaces. We are putting them together in a collective way and keeping in the artistic um, element. But as we think about how do we bring, actually it's not about rehearsing first. For us, it's first bringing the dancers back to the studios. And we have a professional ballet school as well that we um, have taught all over the world, our, our students come from everywhere. So we had to return them home and they actually are, uh, we have 80 Zoom classes a week that are still happening. 80 and, Zoom classes? Yeah, 80 classes that are uh, done via Zoom. We do company class twice a week uh, for our company, but anybody can dial in, they're publicly available. Um, and so company class is taught in Zoom and we have hundreds of people who take class. Um, but bringing them back to the studios, uh, we're aligning ourselves with Olympic athletes the same way as they're trying to figure out how do they come back to train because a dancer's career is their body and they lose their physique um, within a week of not being active. Uh, if you can't jump, if you can't run, if you can't partner, et cetera, you lose your skill base. So we worked with public health and um, we have a wellness center. And so we are envisioning that um, possibly as early as late June, we would be able to bring people back um, in studios. We will um, put them together in cohorts. Um, so six to 10 dancers can take class together. It's the same cohort every single time. Um, and uh, we'll spread them um, through the studios. They'll be socially distanced and at least get the training component. Once we master that, and the reason for cohorts is really to, if we had an outbreak or somebody tests positive, we only take out a portion of our artists at the same, you know, and we can continue um, everybody else to work. Um, we have also thought about how do we bring the staff back? We all, we were uh, fortunate that there were planning. We have all of our systems that are cloud-based. So we have not missed a, a step. We have kept everybody working. We have not furloughed staff. We have not furloughed dancers or artists. And one of the <clears throat> other things that isn't about bringing artists back, but day three after being in this situation, we launched our uh, critical relief fund and it was to support our workforce and our, our artists and keep creative. And that was absolutely, um, has been um, a lifeline line. It's been crowdsourced. It's, we have learned so much about putting cause related um, in this crisis. So I don't know, it feels like we are throwing everything um, up in the air and reinventing. And, and James, you are encountering a similar set of circumstances in that although you are not physically training, the, the training is really about how do you play together as, as a symphony orchestra? How do you ensure that people are, have that sort of ephemeral, nonverbal communication that happens in the greatest of performances? How are you encountering this in Indianapolis? Well, Mark, thanks for inviting me to participate in this discussion and, and hope everyone uh, is staying safe and healthy during this time. 
it's really a challenge. I, to be a, to be a virtual orchestra is uh, is, a, is a 21st century construct uh, put on a 19th or 18th century model, and uh, I will say that we've been uh, our musicians have been incredibly inventive about how they how they uh, uh, make music together virtually, and so the musicians themselves have created a number of uh, really interesting uh, uh, attempts at making music virtually. Uh, but we know that uh, going forward, the challenge is going to be how do you gather musicians safely on the same stage? Uh, and, and I don't know that that's a, uh, I'm interested in Kelly's idea in terms of uh, small cohorts of dancers working together. It's probably more challenging for us when you think about needing 60, 70 or 80 musicians to be in one, one spot at one time. Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's frankly, it's the, it's the same uh, challenge that sports leagues are having uh, in terms of playing playing uh, sports at this at this point in time is how do you maintain uh, that close distance and do it safely as musicians? So uh, we have not. Yeah, we've also been selling the idea of live live music, right, as opposed to recorded music, right. This idea of coming together and feeling the reverberation in the hall and sitting with people, and now we find ourselves. We have to think about this this sort of hybrid model of yes, the excitement of live, but we we're intermediated by these electronic means. That's right, but we have the advantage as as uh, being a musical organization in that our musicians can play solo or in small groups, and I'm thinking you know, there there's nothing but video content out there in in, in just bushels and baskets in, on the internet. How can we connect with our community? And by that, I mean our local Indianapolis community, our patrons, the donors, the subscribers. Can we connect with them on a really uh, smaller scale, very personally? Can our musicians do a, uh, a small concert for a small number of people that, as it would be in a salon or something of that nature? I think that's where we can be really effective and we can be local during this time as opposed to just creating another one of those Brady Bunch videos with a hundred musicians, which are wonderful and, and valiant efforts. And I really applaud all the institutions and orchestras doing those kinds of things. And we've done some as well, but how can we be, how can we connect directly at this time with those who are really key to the success of our institutions? It seems that we're all, we're all being uh, forced by circumstance to reinvent uh, do you all think that this is going to lead to a uh, sustained change in, in your organizations and the relationship of the audience uh, with, uh, with your performers? I, I absolutely think so. Um, one of the things that we have been doing to James's um, uh, thought is um, actually doing small chat with um, with our audience members, with our uh, major donors and our artists. Um, and we also are connecting them with the creation mode. So uh, uh, putting them behind the, the scenes and um, showing them how we are doing these digital performances. We have a 49 uh, member orchestra as well. And so the orchestra members are now collaborating with dancers. So uh, we're doing improvs where um, certain musicians are connecting with dancers, they're creating, um, we're post-production create. We just did something called a chain letter where actually the whole orchestra <laughs> um, uh, was, played their parts digitally. Our uh, conductor actually took them and merged them into something um, that sounds like an orchestra. And then our dancers uh, danced to that. It was put together and that chain letter is now going to um, different ballet companies. So uh, New York City just added to the chain and we're putting that together. We're putting it back to um, our audiences were doing watching parties, listening parties. We actually put free content every Friday. We are releasing new content. Um, and it really has um, allowed us to connect with the public and the artist in a way they've never been able to connect before. Q&A sessions before and after. Um, so I think some of this will come back with us when we go back to our more pr traditional way of working. And how are you all marketing, uh, Jenny? How are you how are you connecting with your audiences in that same vein? 
Well, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because we work with so many artists who visit or who are local, but uh, the gospel choirs are really our sole resident ensemble. And uh, we've, in the past, you know, many years, developed some unique projects with artists and brought them into our uh, series, not only with a, a straight ahead performance, but often with unusual repertoire or formats and touch points with local artists and our education program. So the fact that we can bring, or the possibility of bringing an artist to have a really rich sort of digital residency is also doing what, what Kelly was saying, which is bringing the patrons and the artists together in ways where actually technology democratizes that process um, and makes even more possible in terms of the through lines and connections. So one of the challenges to our field, I think, is to differentiate what we're doing and how we're serving artists and frankly, providing more of a compelling platform for artists because they can uh, control a great deal more of their own presentation to the public and we can be their best partners in that. And that's what I think some of this um, online uh, fluidity has enabled and we see a huge amount of content, but focusing it through the values and missions of our organization is the great opportunity ahead. We've all talked through the years about the importance of connecting audiences to these, these arts and these arts institutions when they're not buying tickets, right? You're sort of preparing that relationship. And now we're actually forced to do that. And also we're grappling with how to monetize that relationship so that it's self-sustaining. Yeah, you know, one thing I'll just mention that we did early on, and it was a guess on our part, uh, but it is paying out off to be a good retention strategy of um, our, our earned revenue um, uh, audience is that we gave people, re asked them to either donate back their tickets, uh, which we, we all know how to do, um, or keep their uh, tickets um, on account um, in, in a, a solidarity that we would be back or ask for a refund. And it's been really interesting. 34% um, uh, donated back, 61% kept it on account, and a very low, uh, less than 5% um, asked for a refund. So that allowed us on a cash flow basis to keep a lot of cash. Um, in the door, and um, secondarily is we we know that people are ready to come back. Now we'll have to deal financially when they use that credit, but when we actually we haven't announced our 21 season yet, but when we do, it won't be as big of a, a draw into their pocketbook because they 60% of our, our season was canceled, so they mm -hmm. have a large amount that they can put forward and still commit. So. Um, we're looking at how we backfill, you know, that, um, that, that, um, that on account um, from a cash point of view, but it has retained um, the deepening that we've done to our existing audience has been um, surprisingly um, 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 poignant, let me put it that way. And James, have you found the same kind of, of, of approach effective in Indianapolis? We have, and, and it's, it's remarkable when I look at the figures from across the country, I'm seeing the same thing and just about everywhere. It's, it's really heartening and our audiences have responded the same way. Very few are asking for outright refunds. Most of them are investing in our future by putting those concerts uh, on account uh, for future times. It's, it's really incredibly heartening. I will say, I mean, it, it's gonna be a challenge for us as an institution because that, yes, cash flow that's, that's going to be very challenging for us. And I can tell you that uh, subscriptions for next season, we did announce our season some months ago. It's very slow. It's, it's, it's certainly a big, it's one of my biggest concerns in terms of cash flow overall. Uh, we've seen that contributions are, are generally continuing at a good pace, uh, certainly not at, at, uh, at, at a surprisingly robust pace, but they're good, they're strong. But ticket sales are going to be the real challenge coming back because uh, people are not ne necessarily wanting to make a, a fresh commitment today. They'll, they'll, they'll roll those tickets over into next season, but they're not necessarily buying new subscriptions in, in big numbers. And, and the impetus to try and monetize this sort of digital content is, is, is so important as well. So um, we may be a little bit too early in the arc, but um, I think that James is making a really important point that 
we've got to be very careful about our costs because if, if we're not careful about our costs and they run away, our, our livelihood is threatened and, and our, our future, the future of these, these art institutions are threatened. Jenny, you were, you were going to say something. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, please go on. It's no, 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 it's, 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 it's quite all right. No, I, I absolutely acknowledging that we didn't, we hadn't announced our season. Um, so we're still really recalibrating and shrinking what we do just to match the concern about the economy and resources. One thing I have to say as we speak about the loyalty of our patrons is that so many of our foundations and government supporters that had previously provided project support have gotten ahead of this by creating either independent funds and, and emergency funds, but most importantly, recognizing that general operating support is what institutions need now and that we need a little bit less pressure on the reporting and on the matching requirements because this is a cash issue and it's also a project issue then. And, the trust that is built between the patron, whether it's foundation or individual, um, is really paramount now. So whatever we're conveying and the work that we're doing, um, I'm hoping will provide continued reassurance to our funders that the general operating support and the, um, the pragmatism of our organizations is going to create good stewardship for those dollars as they're available. But that was a very significant pivot as well from the philanthropic community. I want to recognize that. Let's talk about that, that pivot from the philanthropic community, from the artists, from your audiences, from your patrons. The, the arts are so important. You know, we're talking about life and death in a pandemic, but the arts are so important of keeping our spirits up and keep giving us the energy to keep going. And creation doesn't, isn't suspended during the worst of times. Could you talk about the meaning of art in your community, James, and then let's let let's let's talk about it in a broader sense, not just in terms of the particular art forms that we represent, but why is art and why is support of the arts so worthy of our investment in these times, James? Thanks, thanks, Mark. And I think the uh, I've been astounded by the number of of uh, visitors to our site to listen to archived concerts. We've been broadcasting. At our normal concert times, we've been sharing out streams of, of uh, previous archive, archive content. And I tell you, people are hungry, and they, they, but they want to go local. They're very interested in what's happening in their town. And that's, that's so much of the, of the important message that we as arts organizations have to, have to consider is that our funders, our patrons, our donors want us to be collaborative even during this period of time. And so we're reaching out to our, our fellow institutions. And I've had more conversations with museum directors, Charles and companies, Benicio, right? Absolutely. I, I, we speak on a, uh, at least a weekly basis. And I think that this collaborative effort is going to result in really something wonderful now. Uh, I think we'll figure out ways to collaborate virtually, but then coming back, I think that that's gonna make our community so much stronger our communities are, are so much, um, they take pride because of the arts and what the arts can bring to the community. Uh, and they miss us greatly during this time and they wanna see us working together going forward. And Indianapolis is a great town for that, right? You have both the local and the national purview there. And, and you have institutions where if you look at the boards, there's, there's so many um, sort of uh, uh, cross uh, fertilized um, points in a place like Indianapolis, but that's also true in a in a small town like Washington D.C., right? The, the the heart of the nation as as its capital, or San Francisco, um, uh, just an amazing arts place. Um, Kelly, what are you, what are you experiencing in terms of of collaborations and 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 how people view the arts? Yeah, you know, um, there, there's two concepts that I'll throw out there that we've been thinking a lot. In San Francisco, since we sheltered first um, locally with our arts leaders, we're meeting, we've been meeting uh, every week uh, via phone call and uh, really in an advocacy um, way uh, because we are in the home of Nancy Pelosi. We have been really active about making sure the nonprofit sector and the art sector is included in any any um, bill that comes out having to do with stimulus 
stimulus or the CARES Act. So um, it has brought us together in a way um, we haven't, but we've talked about two concepts. One in San Francisco, first out, last to return. So um, we have to prepare that because the performing arts and mass gathering will be in our plan in our city um, is, you know, phase four, the very last phase. So how do we support each other um, through workforce sharing um, and really starting to get an, a, a system together where we know what the needs of all other or arts organizations are and how can we assist. So we've kind of been a divide and conquer. The other concept is this, we've gone to change our thinking from a global marketplace to hyper-local. Because what we are uh, experiencing, I also have a weekly call of all my um, colleagues across the nation um, in ballet. And so what we're experiencing in our regions are very different. And we are also seeing our audiences being very hyper-local. And so this global community, although we're all connected, um, we are going to find ourselves having to invest in a very hyper local where people may not travel, people may not feel comfortable doing what they used to do, cities may transform just business wise how they do business. So we're trying to understand what that hyper local, it is an advantage to an, a live arts organization um, to serve its community, but it changes our, our thinking. Right. And, and also your investment in terms of, of where you invest your, your funds, but also your attention. And, and, and you have a requirement to ensure that the artist's ecosystem, the, the platform for artists are right. preserved within, within your ecosystem. Yeah, and we That's don't exist without our artists. And the same thing in Washington, right, Jenny? Absolutely, through our Mars Arts DC program, we focus on local artists. And um, I think our goal is to get artists back to work. The optimism that you all are displaying and also the sense of empowerment. You're not frozen, right? No. You have the, some of the biggest challenges that anyone has because our traditional approach to experience this art has been a group approach. We have to social distance. We can no longer hold on to those old models. And you're basically taking that as a challenge and you and your teams and your artists are meeting that challenge. It's not easy, but wow, I mean, just, just so much admiration for, for all of you and, and support for all of you coming from all of us who experience and are grateful for your art. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny Bielfeld uh, of the Washington Performing, uh, Washington Performing Arts, James Johnson of Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, and Kelly Trudell of the San Francisco Ballet. Thank you so much for your, for your optimism for your performances, and please extend our thanks to your artists and your teams. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.